the average age when they start talking about a past life, two or three when they start coming out with it. Sometimes they'll even be making signs, like hand signs, like finger to the head, and they talk about how they've been shot. So it starts very early. In our cases where the child remembers a life as a member of the opposite sex, it's 80% of those kids show gender nonconformity. The suggestion would be past life has had an impact on how their gender is developing. This one. The archivist, she went to the library of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences and got all the materials on this movie night after night, most of which was about stars in the movie. But then there's one picture of this guy could identify him as, as this man, Marty Mart. I really thought it was unlikely that this extra had this dramatic life that Ryan was describing. Marty Mart did. So Ryan talked about dancing on stage in New York and, and Marty get this on Broadway. Then he said he went to the Hollywood to work in the movies, which Marty Martin did mostly work on, on dance in the movies. Said he had this big house with a swimming pool and this street name had he that the word rock and uh, Marty Martin lived on North Rocks Ferry. If your parent listening to this and you suspect that your child may be displaying some sort of past life memory, is there anything that they should do or shouldn't do to create a safe space for that? Um. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with guest suggestions. Light, you should interview President Obama. You should interview Oprah Winfrey. And look, I'm definitely sending out invitations to people like that all the time. But something that you can do right now to help make it easier for those kinds of guests to say yes to my invitation is to subscribe to my channel. Because that's the first thing that their gatekeepers are going to do is they want to see how big is this podcast. And one of the go-to metrics for determining the size of a podcast is to look at how many subscribers a channel has. That's why you always hear podcasters like me saying, please subscribe to this channel. I'm just being honest. So if you could just hit the subscribe button right now, that's literally the best way that you can help me get you bigger guests on this show. All right. Thank you so much in advance for that. And back to the show. What's an example of a case that where memory was triggered and then once it was triggered, it became like a whole, a whole thing for the kid that they, that he, you know, played out on a regular basis. And I'm thinking of James three, but maybe there's another one or that yeah. one, either one. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, that one actually started at a very early age, started with nightmares. So I, I, I mean, he had visited an air museum, but it wasn't immediate that he quit that happen. But, uh, there's one case, for instance, in Sri Lanka, where the family was taking a bus trip and at one of the stops, boy started saying that he had lived there before and then gave various details. Um, and then later people went back and you know, tried to investigate then found in fact the details matched a child who died there. It does happen, but, but it's more typical where it's just spontaneously the children start saying, you know, I used to do this or um, I had different parents and you know, my last mom did such and such. Right. And I think that it, it, it leads into this idea of the sort of separate ways that our society, our Western society treats the idea of reincarnation versus uh, maybe Asian societies or just more ancient societies. And so after a couple of years of volunteering, you, you, were, you were invited to go to Asia to study some of these cases. Can you, can you talk a little bit more about what you saw in terms of those differences and the way that they get handled by the families and by the society itself. Yeah, so that was in the late nineties that I went and that was before was before we had an internet site, a website. And you know, before the internet fully got going. So anyway, my point is at the time we didn't realize there were so many Americans. Um so you know, the reason that Ian Stevenson had gone all over the world studying cases was he went wherever he could find them. And, and he had people looking for them in various places. So in Asia, what a surprising number of parents who are Buddhist or Hindu I mean, believe in reincarnation, but a surprising number actually do not like their children talking about a past life. Uh, there's a belief in some places that talking about a past life will cause you either to get sick or to have a short life this time around. 
Uh, and there are also times where what the child says after a while gets irritating parents. You know, my, my last parents were much better or yeah, I had a much better health. Um, <laughs> so like in India, about 35% of the parents will try to suppress what the children say. But even so, I think the difference is that they believe the children, they just don't want them talking about that life, but they, they believe it. And, and that is very different from many American families where the parents don't believe it and may not even recognize, it. you know, that they think that parent, I mean, the child is just fantasizing, uh, or just talking nonsense and they kind of love it all. Um, now there are plenty of American parents who don't do that. And of course, those are the ones we're likely to hear from. But um, it is a different uh, way of responding uh, to such statement. Also in Asia, well, to some extent here too, but in Asia, if a family has lost a family member and then they, a child starts saying that they used to be grandpa, um, many of the families are relieved by that. And, and uh, they, they may want the child to be the reincarnation of, of that person and, and they may encourage the child to talk more. So it, you know, it can go either way. And, and, um, with those cases, especially the same family cases, we do have the concern that there's been such a, a wish, uh, by the family to have the person return that it, it has really colored the case. And, and, um, you know, you may have either led the child to say more, or maybe the, the family misinterpreted the child is. Do you remember uh, the case of Chloe in Thailand, speaking of, of, of which, and, uh, and that kind of, I wanted to also circle back around to the birthmark uh, aspects of these cases, but can you, can you recount that story for us? We can kind of bridge those two things together. Yeah. So that, that's a case that a colleague and I, Jurgen Kyle, uh, studied a long time ago now, but it was a little boy where his grandmother, um, before she died, it said how she wanted to come back as a male. And um, after she died, her daughter-in-law took some white paste and made a mark on the back of her neck. Um, and then a year later, this grandchild was born, um, this little boy. And he was born with a birthmark that really looked quite like somebody had just made a mark on the back of his neck. It's this, this pale uh, thing you're going down the neck. Um, and then when he got older in that talk, he didn't talk a lot about her life, but, but did say that he'd been her and identified, uh, like different things that had been hers. Um, and he also, um, showed a lot of gender nonconformity, um, where he would, uh, well, he'd want to wear her dresses or her makeup of jewelry a lot. Uh, he, he would not do sort of the typical rough and tumble boy play there, but, but would be playing with the girls more and, and, and various other things, um, which at the time we actually published the case as, as what was then known as gender identity disorder. And of course, things have really evolved since then. Uh, but yeah, with gender nonconformity, um, in the general population, most young children show sort of gender typical behaviors and, or stereotypes typical behavior, really. And, and, yeah, we can talk a lot about what may lead to that, but, but most kids will show gender typical behaviors, like little boys playing with trucks or little girls playing with dolls and, and give them all kinds of environmental influences. But anyway, that's what we see. Uh, but about 3% of boys and 5% of girls will show gender nonconformity. Well, in our cases where the child remembers a life as a member of the opposite sex, it's 80% of those kids show gender. Uh, so the you know, suggestion would be that there's past life that's had an impact on, on how their, their gender uh, is developing in this one. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Chloe, where I guess she was, he was born into the same family of this person who passed, there could also have been this is what a skeptic may think. There could also have been an expectation. Uh, so maybe they were like, you know, cherry picking different ideas or evidence to show that this is who this person actually was. But you guys have a 
uh, control for that, <laughs> which is you, it, maybe not in this case, but in other cases, you show the children a couple of photographs from different aspects of their memory to see what they, um, what they remember and what they don't remember. So maybe can you talk about an example of, of that where, where you've controlled for, yeah. for that memory? Yeah. So I mean, to finish up with Sarah and Chloe, I mean, you're right, of course, that, 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 I mean, it occurs to us, you know, is, mm-hmm. is it that the, uh, the child's, um, family's expectations kind of created some of this gen- gender nonconformity and, um, uh, at least at the time that we published a paper on gender identity disorder, there, there was no reason to uh, suspect that family's expectations caused that. Uh, so it gets complicated. And, and, uh, you know, these same family cases have inherent weaknesses that other cases do not, because either the child could learn things about a previous family member, overhearing things, even though parents don't know that they can, um, or that the parental expectations then do shape the child's behavior or the, uh, the statements. Um, but most of our cases don't involve safe families. Um, and as far as the photographs that you talk about, so we've been able to do more of that lately, uh, doing photograph tests because we were learning about cases earlier, uh, than we often used to. So with the American cases. Uh, Ian would hear about cases, but it would often be, say, 20 years later where the parents learned about his work when they wrote him to say, you know, when my adult child was, was growing up, he, he did this or said that. Um, but now, of course, if a child is talking about a past life, parents do a Google search and, and uh, find out about us and can write us. So when we catch kids that are still young and still have these memories, what we try to do is show the control picture test where, uh, for instance, one recent one is a little boy who remembered a life in, uh, or a death in the Vietnam war, remember being a, an American soldier in the Vietnam war. And he told his mother, he gave a last name in, in the state where he said he was from. So she went on the Vietnam Memorial website and was shocked to see that there was the guy with that name. And it's, it's an unusual name. Uh, that I uh, was killed in Vietnam and, and the boy had said he was 21, which is how old his name was. Um, so she then wrote to us. She didn't try to do any further uh, investigation of, of this previous man, but I did and found a variety, eventually a variety of pictures. Um, so I would show him, for instance, the high school where the man went to, uh, versus a control high school. Uh, from a, a, another place and would ask him if, if he remembered even one of them. And, and also some people, friend of life, um, pictures from yearbooks, so a variety of things. And, and anyway, I showed him eight pairs of pictures. There were a couple of them that he didn't make a choice on, but for the others, he was six out of six. Uh, so, and you know, the, his, there's no chance that his mom let on those. She didn't know which picture was the, the right one either. So that there was no parental influence in this case. Uh, and yet he, he showed this ability, which, you know, if you think, well, it's just luck. Well, you know, it's like flipping a coin, have it come up head six times in a row. It, it happens, but it, you know, the chances of it happening are quite small. I, I watched your Netflix. There's a, a documentary series on Netflix called Surviving Death, and you're in a couple of the episodes. And so it was one thing to read about these cases and how the children behave, but there's another thing to actually see it and to see the nonchalance with which they're like looking at the photos and just like casually, you know, choosing as if there's, there's no question in the world that this is what, what it is. It's like, if any, if anyone was showing any one listening to this, a picture of their childhood home, you would know it instantly, right? Unless you moved around a lot, but if you were in the same place for a significant period of time, you would know it instantly. You would know the pictures of your parents and things like that. Do you find out of the people that reach out to you, what percentage of these cases would you say by the time it gets to you, Dr. Tucker, what percentage would you say are legitimate cases versus cases where maybe, I don't know why someone, what motivation would someone would have to, to not be legitimate, but. Well, I think there are, 
probably all or almost all legitimate in the sense that the families are being honest about it. Uh, mm -hmm. But what we often get, uh, the vast majority of the time, actually, with the emails, is the child has talked about a past life, but he or she has not given the kinds of details that allow the memories to be verified. Now, mm -hmm. if you don't name a person or a place, it's very hard to find out if somebody from the past actually matches the child's statements. Um, so, you know, the, the child may talk with great emotion about a past life and, and may give a lot of details and, and sometimes grisly details. I mean, being raped and murdered and all kinds of things, which, you know, you wonder why a three-year-old would be doing that. But again, without names or places, unless it's a really unique kind of uh, death, um, we're not able to verify. Um, so we, we are just looking at this in the last year, we've heard from 150 American families, um, about their child talking about a past life. Uh, but, but very few of them have we even tried to investigate because there's not enough. I mean, we'll do some on, online searching, but there's often not enough there to, uh, be able to confirm it. Um, but there are enough cases where we do verify it that I think it, it lends a legitimacy to any of the cases, whether they're uh, verified or not. So, you know, if your child is having these terrible memories about a violent death um, and you're trying to comfort them, it, it may be helpful to know that plenty of these cases, when the child has done that, there actually was somebody who licked the knife and matches the memories that the child has. So, you know, that the, the uh, parent can know that this is something that they can take seriously and not necessarily build it up for the child, but I mean, that they can be respectful of what the child is saying because we have so many cases where it turns out to be true. You also make a distinction in your book when you talk about your own intent as a, as a scientist and a researcher between proof and evidence. Can you, can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, proof is a very high bar that in medicine, uh, we always never reach. So, you know, when, when new medications get approved, it means that there have been studies that show there's a very good chance that they work better than placebo. And of course we can identify just what that chance is. So, you know, the, the kind of bar is 95%, uh, chance that it, that it works. No, for, but that's not true. I mean, that's evidence that it works, but it's not truth that it does. And the same applies to work like this. I mean, we can't give a percentage, but you know, we're, we're, we're the only proof of, we, I don't know what proof of past life memories or the consciousness has continued from one life to another. Um, I don't know what proof would it look like. Uh, but I do know what evidence looks like. So when a child comes up with very specific details, they can only match one person who died in the past and they're complete strangers to the family. Well, you know, that's strong evidence. Um, Ian Stevenson used to say, and will be too, uh, that proof is started that should only be used in mathematics, uh, in, the, in the world of science, again, it's, it's about the level of evidence, uh, not it's sort of unobtainable absolute tree. Would you mind um, recounting the story of uh, Ryan and his memory of, of Marty uh, yes. in, in relation to this evidence and, and just the striking detail of yes. the evidence, particularly as a younger person versus as an older teenager? Yeah, and that's one that, yeah, as you know, it's all this surviving death series. But that was one where, I mean, these days we mostly get emails, but that was when we actually got a letter through the U.S. mail uh, for this mom in Oklahoma who um, said that, that she and her husband are just ordinary thugs. She worked in the county clerk's office for her husband's a police officer. But their little five year old boy, Ryan, for the last year had talked about a past life in Hollywood. And he would cry and beg his mother to, to take him home to Hollywood. And this was quite hard for her to 
could do it. You know, it's hard to, as a parent, to see your child suffering and, and he was suffering on a daily basis. So, uh, she had heard that, that if, if kids can kind of process some of this, that, uh, see more of the past life stuff that it, it can help them uh, deal with it. So she went to the public library and checked out some books on Hollywood. And they were looking through one of them one day when, uh, Ryan pointed to a picture. There's this picture from an old movie called Night After Night. Uh, it's actually the first movie that Mae West was in, but, um, the picture just shows a group of men, uh, and a couple of them sort of in the middle, uh, everyone's focused on. And he pointed to one of those and said, Hey, mama, this George, we did a picture together. And then he pointed to one of the men on, on the end and said, mama, that's me. I found me. Well, the first one he pointed to is George Raft, to a young George Raft, you know, went on, well, you may not know but for those of us at a certain age, but went on to, to be quite well known in his, his day. But the other one he pointed to that he said he had been, uh, was an extra with no light. So Ryan's mom wrote to me to see if I could help uh, determine who this fellow was. Um, so I went out and, and met, went to Oklahoma and, and met Ryan and his parents. And um, then afterwards, and, and well, let me just say, I think it was helpful for the family, certainly for Ryan's mother, that if nothing else, I, I was respectful of what they were going through, that you know, I had traveled halfway across the country to, to take seriously uh, what they were experiencing. Um, so afterwards, as we were trying to figure out who this fellow was, Ryan's mom was writing me, emailing me, some on a daily basis with all of these statements that Ryan was making about the past life, which of course we could then log. And eventually with the help of a Hollywood archivist and, and a TV film crew, it's sort of a long story, but with the help of an archivist, we were able to find out who this was. And the archivist, she went to the library of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences and I don't know really good for such a library, but got all the materials on this movie night after night, uh, most of which was about uh, the stars of the movie. Uh, but then there's one picture of this guy and on the back of it, it identified him as, as this man, Marty Martin, hmm. um, you know, which meant that we could think compare what Ryan said to Marty's life. And, and it turned out that. Even though I really thought it was unlikely this, this extra had had this dramatic life that Ryan was describing. Marty Mark did. So Ryan talked about dancing on stage in New York and, and Marty get danced on Broadway. And he, then he said he went to, to Hollywood to work in the movies, which Marty Martin did mostly work on, on dance in the movies. Um, said that he, uh, had been uh, worked for uh, an agency where uh, people changed their names and, and Marty Martin started a successful talent agency. I uh, said he had this big house with a swimming pool and, and that the street name had either the word rock or melt in it. And, um, uh, Marty Martin lived on North Roxbury, um, talked about sailing on ships and then uh, seeing Paris, which Marty Martin did with his, with his wife. Uh, and Ryan also said that one day he said he didn't know why God would let you give the 61 and then make you come back and get a baby. And Marty Martin's death certificate, he died in 1964. His death certificate said that he was only 59, but his daughter and, and his stepson busted. In fact, it was 61. So I looked into it and found, um, a passenger list, three census records and two marriage listings that all gave ages that meant in fact, Marty Martin was 61 when he died. So Ryan was right about that. Um, even though the death certificate said 59. Um, so all together there, we were able to verify that over 50 of Ryan's statements matched with Marty Martin's life. Um, a few were off and then many more were unverifiable. I mean, there were little details about daily life, which, you know, that long ago, we weren't able to verify about 55 of them we were. And at the time there was nothing on Marty Martin on the internet. Um, eventually now people have actually filled in some of the information after this case got some, some publicity, but there's no way that, that Ryan and, and his family. I uh, found out anything about Marty Martin uh, through some sort of surreptitious name.
Yeah, it's uh, it's fascinating just the level of detail. And and there's another one that I from the book that I wanted you to go into. But as you were talking, I was just kind of curious around, you know, when you think about scientific research and and. And who's funding this stuff? A lot of times, you know, you have pharmaceutical companies and, you know, people who want to kind of make money on the back end in some form or fashion. And I'm just wondering, what is the funding like for this kind of work? I mean, are you got, can you just hop on a plane at any time and go and do some investigation or is it, does it have to be something that gets planned out, get to fundraise to go and, and meet up with someone in Sri Lanka or wherever? Uh well, not exactly. I mean, we don't do uh, bake sales for for sure. But the, <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we fortunately had uh, a number of donors over the years who have been generous, who believed in this work and, and supported it. Um, starting with Ian Stevenson, and and the only way he was able to form this research division was a man named Chester Carlson, who had been at the Xerox process, um, uh, gave a, a lot of money to the university. And and we continue with that. Where I mean, again, it's it's. Um, I mean, we occasionally get grants for this work, but it's mostly donors who are intrigued by uh, this work and you know respectful of it, and, and they uh, help fund our work. How much of your time gets spent sort of verifying or processing a, a single case that seems very promising? Ah, uh, well, it, it varies, and of course, now we can do a lot of that work at our desk, you know, on the internet, but, you know, like with that Vietnam case where, um, eventually I was able to, well, quite a bit of man who died in the 1960s. Um, but I mean, it's usually just one trip to the family, but then again, we can connect about various details that come up, you know, just by email now. Um, but it's, uh, you know, um, sometimes the interviews actually, depending on the kind of case, don't even take more than a couple of hours, but. Uh, but then kind of the work starts and you know, trying to sort out all the details and, and how much of them can be there. So if, if let's say Marty, Marty Martin's case, you know, he comes out, Ryan comes out in his kindergarten years as potentially the reincarnated father to this daughter or, um, you know, his uh, uncle to his niece, they're still around. And Ryan's now a teenager and really doesn't remember much. And, and you even wrote that usually after the age of six or seven, they completely forget and they go on to live normal lives. But does that place any kind of pressure I'm wondering on, on these, either the kids or the family just kind of thinking? Because, I mean, if you hear that level of detail about your family, that all mostly accurate. I mean, you had like 50 something markers for Ryan's case that kind of matched up. It's hard to deny something like that. And I don't know if I'm, what I'm, I'm asking if it gives closure to the family or if it, it puts pressure on, on, on the kid. I'm just wondering what, what have you seen in relation on both sides as, as these, as the years pass, do people just kind of move on or how does it, what, what happens? Well, it can really vary. And I mean, there are some times where the previous family doesn't believe it, uh, but often they do, and and they're uh, especially when the child is really young. Uh, you know, they, they will want to have a relationship with the, the child's family, um, and sometimes they do. So they'll be, you know, they'll. I'm thinking more in age here, but they'll have various trips back and forth. Um, sometimes even after the child has moved on, it doesn't particularly care to see the previous family anymore. But but they're still wanting that connection because. You know, they build a connection to their, their loved one uh, who died. Um, I think, you know, like in, in Ryan's case where the, um, you know, for the TV series, uh, as, as a 16 year old, or I guess he was 15 when they filmed it, but as a 15 year old, um, meeting with Marty Warren's daughter, um, and like say, his niece, I mean, it's, it's too late. So, you know, it can be, I think kind of frustrating for the previous family in that case that they really want to feel this connection and I mean connection to their lost loved one. Uh, but the kid's not in that place anymore. 
Um, so yeah, it can be unsatisfying to them. Um, but another example, yeah, another example of that connection and going back and forth is from the book you talked about Kendra and Ginger. Can you re to recount that story? Because I thought that was really, really interesting. Yeah, I mean, that was one where it's unusual in our, um, in our cases that the girl, well, when she met this um, coach, she felt an immediate uh, attachment to it and was, was much more friendly and loving with her than she was with the strangers. Um, and started to say that she had been uh, in Ginger's tummy and had, had, had gone through an abortion. Uh, and eventually it turned out that the coach did uh, confirm to uh, her mom that, in fact, she had had an abortion. But, but the attachment became incredibly intense, both for the coach and for the child. Uh, where the child has then spent a couple of nights a week at that coach's house. And, you know, I mean, I understand certainly that the wish to maintain that connection is not necessarily what the child needs in their development in this life. And, and eventually the, the, the girl's family had a falling out with, with the coach and severed contact, which I think is probably best for the child. So. Yeah, sort of like with I say to, to parents in general, I mean, certainly be open to what the child is saying, be respectful. Uh, but you don't want to get overly focused on the past life because you don't want, don't want to interfere the experience of this life. And uh, sometimes, you know, people can't, I mean, it is really interesting and, and, uh, and meaningful, but sometimes I think people get a little too focused side and, and need to let the child just be a child and, and enjoy the life. Is there anything, if you're a parent listening to this and you suspect that your child may be displaying some sort of past life memory, is there anything that they should do or shouldn't do to create a safe space for that? Or is there, any, is there like, are, like a few questions that they should ask to verify whether or not this is actually what this is. Yeah. And we've got a short, uh, column of advice for parents on our website, but yeah, as far as what they should do, well, one thing we encourage people to write down the child statements. Yeah. So that's setting a written record for us in, in case it can be verified. Uh, but most of the children recall, uh, a death by some sort of unnatural means, murder, suicide, combat, accident, that sort of thing. And yeah, those members can be troubling to the child. So if the parent can be respectful of that and say, you know, I understand that you remember that, but now you're safe here with us and, and really try to emphasize that, that the past is the past and that, you know, things are different this time around, that can be helpful. I mean, and, particularly in the Asian cases, often the children have gone to the previous place, seen the previous family. And, and then the intense, you might think the intensity of the memories would grow, but they, it actually tends to lessen, uh, mm -hmm. I think partly because their memories are validated. You know, they, they don't have to keep struggling to convince people because there it is, they see it themselves, but they also see that life is going on, moved on and, you know, the families are growing older and have their own lives. Um, so in the same way with, with parents in general, just emphasizing that those memories are behind them and, and this time they're all going to be, they're always going to be sick together and, you know, have life this time. Uh, we don't encourage people to ask a lot of pointed questions. I mean, it's awfully tempting to try to find out what the name is, but the, the concern about it, asking a lot of pointed questions, one, it may upset the child, but two, they may start just making up answers. And mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's better for the most part if you kind of come spontaneously. But you know, when the child, are, uh, the child is in that zone of wanting to talk about these things, you know, certainly ask it open ended questions or what else do you remember or you know, that must have been hard or, or whatever, at letting the child talk. And again, yeah, you know, asking if they remember what their name is or where they lived or whatever. I mean, that's very helpful for us. And if it's accurate.
Yeah. Again, going back to what I saw in the show um, with this case of Atlas. And when he was recounting, he was a young, uh, I think it was a young white kid. He was recounting this past life as a young black child who died on the playground. And I'm just curious, uh, are there any commonalities in terms of like people taking on new ethnicities or the same ones? I know you said they can cross genders. Um, I know that uh, most of these reincarnated people are, or cases are from, uh, their last life was less than two years before they, the, the death was two years before. What are some of the other uh, commonalities that you've seen? Well, as far as ethnicity goes, um, I mean, the kids in a lot of the places where we've studied cases, um, they're not a whole lot of necessarily different ethnicities. I mean, the, mm -hmm. I have, you know, U.S. is sort of a melting pot, but in, in say, I mean, I don't know, Thailand or Burma or whatever. I guess maybe the hard groups, but I mean, for the most part, people, re the kids would call alike in the same country, often fairly close by. I mean, here in the States, we've had some, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of miles, but no, usually it's fairly close. So the way I interpret that is that for intact memories to come through, typically it's things haven't gone too far. I mean, they're, they're, they're uh, yeah, she's usually the same country. It's often kind of, um, same geographical location near, near geographical locations, often, uh, fairly recent life. So it's, it's not, um, uh, for attack memories to come through, it's not something where it's typically on the other side of the world. Um, so with the American cases, um, I'm trying to think of others where they get, uh, you know, they had a different ethnicity or different race. And I can't say that others immediately come to mind, but I'm sure we had them. Uh, but again, with the American ones, I mean, unless we can identify the previous person, we, we don't know what race they were. Uh, but I was, so I was children, a white child would say, oh, that was when I had brown skin or, you know, something like that. But um, the short answer is, you know, we don't know a lot about that. Yeah, I think it's fascinating. I mean, I, 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 I'm, uh, I've been studying sort of spiritual texts for many, many years. And, you know, there's this whole idea of, of obviously karma and just sort of the evolutionary aspect of living and experiencing all sides of humanity. And I know you're not a huge fan of, uh, of past life regression in terms of, you know, any kind of proof that, that, or, or any sense of verifying or validating it. But have you read any of uh, Dr. Michael Newton's work? Journey of the Souls and yeah. all of that. Yeah. One thing I, I'm also, I consider myself to be a skeptic. And one thing I, I appreciated about what I could gather from reading, you know, just it's the one thing to do the research, another thing to read someone else's report of their research. But one thing I appreciated from his books particularly Journey of the Souls, is he seems to present it in a relatively objective fashion. So, you know, it's all transcriptions. You can see the Q&A that he's having with his clients in his office. He's done thousands of cases and all of that. And he, he said that he doesn't, he tries not to leave the patients and say things like, okay, now do you see a white light? Are you floating? He just goes, tell me what's happening now. And now what are you experiencing? And he's seen a lot of overlap in people's reports. So yeah, just from my own personal interest in these kinds of things is just interesting. The implications, all of the implications that I'm sure you've also um, pondered about and, and wondered about, you know, in terms of life after death. Is it just these kids or is everybody experiencing this? And so I'm just curious, like behind the scenes, <laughs> when it's you and your colleagues talking about these cases, is there... Is it purely scientific or is there a little bit of uh, like, like you have your own sort of biases and, and you're kind of, you know, operating within those and you're aware of those or, or, or what is your experience like behind the scenes? Well, well I suppose we all have biases of one sort or another. I mean, sometimes, sure. you know, you hear something and think, well, that's just kind of too far out there for me, but, um, 
but we're, you know, we're not coming at it from any particular, um, spiritual outlook. Um, and I identify now in the groups, uh, spiritual, but not religious and, and, you know, that we're in it trying to figure it out for ourselves, you know, trying to determine for ourselves, well, what's, what's going on here. So I, you know, it's not when I tried to confirm a previous view, it's, it's trying to see kind of where the, the evidence takes us. And I mean, again, we all have particular uh, slants on things, uh, but as much as possible, they, they really are not particularly part of this word. Um, some of the oddities that has, have been reported are kids going for cigarettes and alcohol that they used to consume in their previous life. No. So you have these little six-year-old kids trying to, you know, and, and, you know, tapping the beer bottle in the same way that they used to tap it in their old life to get the last little drop of beer out. Are there, are there any things that you just see that you just think are completely bizarre, bizarre like that? Well, you know, now that you say it, maybe I should view that as bizarre, but it's just, yeah, I mean, these, these kids have a variety of behaviors that seem to be linked to the past life. And, and it includes it, if the previous person's a heavy smoker or drinker, that the, the child will still want those things. Um, and yeah, I guess that is a little odd, but you know, or you can see in their play, sometimes compulsively, uh, doing things that, that there's nothing in their environment that might lead them to as far as we know. Occasionally, grizzly play, like uh, uh, a child, I feel like they're hanging themselves or whatever, but um, it's, it's usually more the occupation. But but even then, you know, like one particular case, this kid played at being a biscuit shopkeeper. I mean, for hours and hours on end. And um, I'm a past life. That's what the guy did, but, but, you know, why the, the, the child is so focused on that and in, in some sort of explain it in some sort of ordinary way, you know, that's a real challenge. Um, so with the behaviors, I mean, it's not firm evidence as much as recalling the name and, you know, where you're from, but it's still, it becomes part of a picture that, that at times can be quite persuasive. When you're not wearing your scientific hat though, well, how would you interpret all of this let's say you had to give a sort of spiritual explanation what would you say well i, I can't really give you a, kind of a pithy answer to that i mean i think well what all this work has led me to do is look at sort of uh the bigger picture of what existence even is or what it means and you know because you can't just map these cases on sort of a typical Western understanding of, of reality, uh, that, you know, physical matter is all there is. I mean, that, that doesn't work in this case. So, you know, with the level of evidence, okay, well, how do you mix things up again? Um, I've eventually come to believe that, and this sort of shares with certainly physicists as well as, as, um, very spiritual traditions, but that, that Consciousness really is the core of reality and, and um, this world that we experience with mean, the basic building blocks in the world, I, I think are not, you know, particles and waves or whatever, but really are observations and, and knowledge. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, you know, become more of an idealist where it, the, the mind is, is really at the core of everything. So, you know, with that, but then you look at these cases as kind of a series of observations or experiences that for whatever reason have continued from one, one like to another, it seems to be the same stream of consciousness or same stream of, of experiences. Um, you know, why that happens in these cases, you know, not in, for all of us as, as far as we know, I mean, that we don't know, but, um, anyway, that, that's kind of my take on all of this at this point. So there is this, I mean, we don't use the term spiritual, because of course there are all sorts of connotations with that, but there is this piece of us, this mind piece or consciousness piece that seems to be at the core of who we are. And mm -hmm. at least in these cases, does not seem to be limited to just the lifespan of brain or the body, uh, but it seems to, to be uh, more primary than that. And, and it's continued through multiple uh, lifespans.
Has there been an evidence-based explanation for deja vu outside of like being a child? Let's say as an adult, we've all experienced it. You go to a place, you feel like you've been there before. Have you seen anything or come across anything that well, I mean, there are neurological, neurological explanations. I mean, it sort of depends on what you mean by things. And yes, I mean, I, I think most of us, maybe all of us, have that experience where, I mean, we, it feels familiar to us. And like, we'll be in a conversation. We can't quite say what's coming next, but it feels like we've experienced it before. And there may well be a neurological explanation for that. Now, one for people that are a place they've never been and are able to identify things, you know, like some of these children have done. Uh, I mean, that's literally deja vu uh, as far as seeing before. Um, and, and of course, can't imagine a neurological explanation that. So, you know, with a lot of this, I mean, again, with medical explanations, they are, there's not necessarily prick, but that's sort of where the evidence or the logic takes people. So, uh, you know, neurologically is, or is whether somehow an impression sort of gets ahead of the, uh, conscious awareness or whatever, it creates this sense that they've experienced it before, uh, would explain the simple cases, but, but not, yeah, yeah, ones. And after, after coming across so much compelling evidence that there is potentially, at least some people experience, uh, reincarnation, what else professionally are you wanting to see in this field? What would you like to see more of? Well, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I would like to see greater awareness on sort of the abilities of mind to exist separate from the brain, either after death or things that it can do. So parapsychology, which, you know, a lot of people think there's nothing to it because they've been told there's nothing to it. And yet there's tons of evidence uh, about particular abilities with with telepathy or, or premonitions or various things. And, and, um, uh, so it would, it would be good to, to see people become more aware of that aware. Mm -hmm. What's your take on destiny? Do you have one? I, I don't have a firm take on yard. Is all of this planned out? Could we kind of, uh, and you know, there are people who talk about you kind of have a contract when you enter a life and mm -hmm. you fulfill it. Um, I don't have strong feeling one way or another about that. Um, I think we may all have, uh, sort of a path that kind of is the best fit for us. Um, but you know, we may get off of that path or we may choose not to follow that path. So in that sense, we don't reach our destiny, but, uh, again, I, I only have a sort of general, general thoughts on it. And your first book in this work was, was it Return to Life? Uh, the first one is called Life Before Life. And life Before the, Life. Yeah, Fall Off was Return to Life. So that's the Life Before Life was the one uh, that you were sending out all the query, query, query letters to see about getting an agent and a publisher. Yeah. Can you just quickly share that story? Because <laughs> I think it's pretty amazing. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I to be perfectly honest, um, when I read any Stevenson's books, I thought I'm, I'm never going to be able to equal this, but if, you know, could I write a different kind of book and you know, write one to make the general public more aware of this work? Um, so I just learned that you write up a book proposal and you, know, you send out query letters to agents. So I, I looked at books and sort of the same general field. Most people acknowledge their agents. So I, I sit on a variety of query letters and, um, one of them I sent. Uh, was to uh, an agent, Patricia Vanderloon, who, uh, Vanderloon, who, um, got my letter, uh, and I guess got my proposal. Now, now it's been so long, I've got to block down the details, but as luck would have it, one of her other authors had just been telling her about the work at UVA and with, you know, with Ian Stevenson, she gets my proposal. And, um, again, as luck would have it, she then had a, a life scheduled with a friend of hers who was an editor at St. Lawrence Trust. She takes the proposal with her and, um, the editor sold on the idea. So I essentially had a contract before I even knew about it. And, um, 
you know, so she, I, I was happy to, to hear that. Um, so, you know, how do you, what do you make of that? Why you can decide I was just lucky that, you know, pieces all fell together. But when things like that happen, yeah, you do kind of wonder about destiny and, and how would that work? I mean, I, you know, the, um, I didn't cause her to have this other author who knew about our work and was telling him about it and, and telling her about it. And, and I didn't cause her friendship with the editor. Uh, but somehow all the pieces, all the pieces put together or fit, all the pieces fit together, uh, so that it's, it worked for me and, and, you know, sort of helped me on the path that I was trying to get to. Um, so people can make of that what they will. And, and I'm sure, I mean, I'm not saying there's anything paranormal about that or, or even that unusual. I mean, I think we've all had situations where pieces fit together in a way that, that take us in a path that, you know, we're very glad to be on. Um, and again, what will make you that? It, it, Go ahead. Yeah, no, it reminds me of the Einstein. Uh, I don't know if Einstein actually said this, but he is attributed to saying, a saying that you can either believe that nothing is a miracle or that everything yeah. is a miracle. And, um, you know, when you think about the implications of your work and, and whether there is life after death and or whether we all come back and maybe some of us remember it and some of us don't remember it. Um, I just think it's really interesting to be on the front lines of that, that sort of research. And, you know, you know, there's this guy called, uh, his name is Dr. Herbert Benson, who was, uh, one of the first researchers and scientists to really in-depthly study meditation back in the 19, late, late 1960s and 70s. And what was interesting about his work when I read a lot deeper into it was that he, even though medit he saw that meditation was, was in particularly transcendental meditation was having all these really amazing changes in the parasympathetic nervous system, things that he had never seen before. And he was a, he was a, he was a researcher of stress and the, the fight flight reaction. And so he saw that meditation could take somebody to the exact opposite direction. And so it was literally the most powerful, uh, method for relaxing the body that he'd ever come across. But he refused to learn meditation or practice it because he wanted to maintain his objectivity, <laughs> which I thought was impressive. I thought that was pretty impressive because it must have been very enticing, you know, and I'm just, I'm imagining in your line of work, it is enticing to, you know, lean into the sort of confirmation bias of, yeah, we're all one. Everything is, you know, connected. There is destiny. I've seen enough. I'm sold. But yet you still maintain this sense of, of objectivity. Is that difficult for you to do? Uh, not really. I mean, my makeup is that, you know, I continue to kind of question everything. Yeah, you know, there are some people who are hundred percent sure of everything. And then there are those <laughs> of us who aren't really a hundred percent sure of much. And, um, you know, I fall into the latter category, which, you know, is, it uh, lends itself to the work to be sure. Now, I don't know that I'm self-sacrificing as, as Herbert Benson in that case. I mean, it, you know, if you do all this work and discover sort of the relaxation response can, can profoundly change your life. And you tell you don't want to do so you keep studying it. I mean, good for him, but well, sort of good for him. Um, I, I admire the commitment to the work, um, but that, you yeah, know, that's, that's something there. Um, but you know, I think with, with our work, I mean, it's not that hard because I don't remember past life and, you know, I'm trying to verify that I ever had past life. Um, so then when we get these reports, I, I'm very curious. I, I have an open mind completely about what is the level of evidence that, that this case provides for a connection to past life. And that's what we try to determine. So, uh, you've also said that you ideally would love to have more American cases. Why is that? Well, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, there are these potential cultural confounds with, you know, if, if everyone around you believes in a past life, you know, it does make it more likely that people may either overinterpret what the child says or the child may start 
thinking they'd had a past life and, and sort of come up with memories. Whereas with our cases, I mean, most of the American families did not believe in reincarnation before their child started talking about a past life. And of course, our culture doesn't. Um, so yeah. that from a scientific standpoint, it, it's a cleaner phenomenon here than it would be in other places. Uh, in addition, I think it can be more persuasive that something out of the ordinary is going on. You, know, you, you can't just dismiss it as something that happens on the other side of the world among people who believe in reincarnation, that it, you know, it's happening down the street. Uh, so I, I think that may help open people's minds more uh, to this phenomenon. And yeah, yes, we do want to keep studying American cases. And you know, if we had 50 cases as strong as, as, strong as, as their uh, best two or three, uh, then it would be very hard for people to think not to seriously consider it. And again, if you're listening, if someone is listening to this and they think possibly, or maybe, I don't know if some people may even wish their child was special in this way. <laughs> Is there any sort of preliminary screening that you said, you said there's a list on your website that they can go to as a sort of a way to kind of determine whether or not this is something that you guys could work with? Is that the first step well, that they would take? Let's go bit. down. Um, but yeah, but again, yeah. I mean, I, it is often not a pleasant experience for the child or the family. So, I mean, I get that people would be curious, but um, if a child is not heard over a past life, they are probably better off not remembering it. So, uh, yeah, because so many of the memories that come through are upsetting and mm -hmm. feeling like you've lost your family, uh, or that, that, um, you have another home or what, and, you know, those things are difficult for children to process. So, um, I, I, and I, I remember you, them. yeah, you also said in the Marty uh, episode that, that, uh, one of the things that he recall, recounted was that he wanted to live his life in a better way, in a different way. He wanted to be less, um, well, well I can't remember exactly well, what he less materialistic, really. Less but, materialistic, yeah. He, yeah, yeah and, and yeah, he felt like he was not greedy in this life and maybe he had been previously. Uh, so I suppose in that sense, I mean, it perhaps was helpful to have in his development that he could see, I want to be better than that this time. Uh, but he also, you know, he suffered a lot. I mean, he, he had a, a lot of ties where he was very upset. Right. right. Um, how did, how, I'm assuming you, you feel fulfilled now in this line of work. How, how, how does that feel different to what you were doing before in, in child psychiatry, just in you and your body and your, in your day to day? Cause I, I just want people to understand the differences, at least from your perspective. Well, I actually like the mix I have now where I'm, I'm doing work in the clinic where, you know, we are, we're helping people. And, uh, since I'm not doing it eight to five every day, I, I, I can appreciate it more. And, and, and I think I actually probably do a better job. I mean, I think I'm able to connect with the families more and uh, yeah, help them through what they're going through. But then I also get to look at the big picture and, and you know, these, ask these big questions and, and try to explore the answers. Uh, and I enjoyed the writing part of it too. But um, so it's all together. It just works for me better than, um, than, than when I was just doing clinical care. Okay, so I want to just do a hypothetical with you as we wind down. <laughs> if you're, you'll play along with me. Imagine if you didn't go into the Quest bookstore, you never got invited to volunteer with Dr. Stevenson's work, and you were just kind of, your life just went on whatever path it ended up going on, aside from what you're doing now. And you can go back and knowing everything you know now from being fulfilled and living this life, you can go back to the old Dr. Tucker and give him any words of wisdom, any advice back in the early 90s. Is there anything you'd say about how to proceed? Uh, well, um, I think, you know, there are times where we have a goal that we're working toward and we just focus on it like a laser beam would go toward it. There are other times where um, we just have to be open to 
what may come and, and uh, not exactly just sort of float on the current, but, but, um, you don't have to have necessarily a clear direction to be gone somewhere, you, but you do have to have a, a mindset of, of being open to what opportunities may come. And, you know, it's, it's challenging. I mean, we all, or, you know, a lot of people have sort of dreams of what they'd like to do, but we operate in, in the real practical world. And, you know, a lot kind of had to fall into place where this worked out for me. Um, if it hadn't, or, you know, I don't know, I, I think I would have continued to work for something more uh, than what I had been and, you know, could have found it in other ways. And, and obviously, I mean, people find meaning in many ways. And, and I mean, the most meaning I find in my life is this, um, me of true that the love with my family. So, you know, being a good husband and father, now grandfather, uh, is, is really where I derive the most meaning. And so sometimes it means, um, discovering meaning that's kind of there all along and, and maybe we're not fully appreciating it. Uh, other times it means making the changes in your life that, that you need to, uh, so that things will work better. Yeah. Well, looping back around to, um, how we started, I, I, I've been asking that question ever since I started this podcast, what's your uh, favorite toy or activity as a child? And a part of that is because I suspected that it has something to do with what they end up doing as an adult. But now after coming across your work, it could also have something to do with what they did as an adult in the previous lifetime. Well, and I think that's, that's right. That's yeah. so interesting. Um, I mean, there was a psychologist who would focus on not necessarily Charles' favorite toy, but the uh, first memory. Not that that first memory caused them to turn out the way they did, but the fact that that's the one that they remember is indicative of, of uh, meaning now. I mean, as you look back, it's important what it says about the person as an adult. Um, so it's kind of similar with what Tori do you remember? Yeah, may may well be kind of influenced by the kind of person you became. Yeah. And 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 I I I I'm very honest with myself about the fact that I use um very sort of generous confirmation bias in connecting the dots between what they do now or what they're passionate about now versus what they started off doing. Because I found that in everyone's life journey that I've talked to. And you can make the argument that I only talk to people who have this particular experience, um, but they've gone through some sort of moment of confusion or uncertainty, or they felt unfulfilled. That's why it's called at the end of the tunnels, because once they get through that period, they finally, they find their calling or their passion or they, or they lean into it. And this light inside of them turns on it and everybody who is around them can see it and it's attractive and you inspire people to want to invite you to talk on podcasts and want to, you know, feature you and profile you and hear what you have to say about whatever it is that you're passionate about. And then hopefully someone seeing your example will be inspired to do the same thing. And so um, all that to say, I just want to acknowledge you for taking the leap to reach out to Dr. Stevenson and. Um, and in a way, taking the baton, you know, after he retired and, and going all into this work, I love that little anecdote you shared about how you wondered whether you wondered how people would dress to go to one of these little research meetings. <laughs> if you, you wore the most casual shirt tie that you had and you walked in and, and Dr. Stevenson was wearing a three piece suit. And so it, in seeing you in the, in the show, I saw you, you were dressed very smartly. So I think you've kind of found a hybrid there <laughs> you don't have a three-piece suit but you definitely have a nice style so i want to acknowledge you for that and uh and just yeah just for for inspiring us with your work and and i hope it it continues and and if anybody is, is interested in learning more about it i would highly recommend that they start with um so is before the actual book or is that the name of the two books combined? Because that's what I got. I got. Yeah, before. that's the, the new edition, uh, the new two in one edition. So yeah, before has both uh, life before life where it turns to life in it. Got it. Okay. But the recent one that you wrote was return to life. 
Yeah, that was in 2013. Um, so yeah, it's been a while. Okay. So before is the combination. So yeah, start with before, because you also cite a lot of Dr. Stevenson's work as well. Yeah. yeah. And um, and yeah, it's just really fascinating stuff. Really, really fascinating stuff. And also check out the Netflix special, Surviving Death. Well, I, I appreciate the kind words. And yeah, it's, I, I'm glad to hear that people are touched by the work and, and, uh, and we'll, we'll keep going. Yeah. All right, man. Well, thank you so much. And uh, we'll put up all the links to everything we mentioned in the show notes. And uh, maybe one of these days we'll, if I ever pass through Charlottesville or, you know, we're somewhere in the same city, I'll be cross paths. Yeah. By all means. Yeah. If you're heading this way, sir, I'll let me know. All right. Take care. All right. Thanks. Bye. If you like that video, you're going to love the next one. Click this thumbnail right here and I'll see you over there.